well. Look at that thing. Like, so mysterious and oddly lifelike, that eye in the middle. Like, it's like staring at you like, mm. it's kind of creepy, but it proper draws you in. That thing is weird. Like, I love it. So this weird, creepy, yet yeah, absolutely stunning object is called the Engraved Hourglass Nebula. And it's what we call a planetary nebula in our own Milky Way, just over 8,000 light years from Earth. And a planetary nebula, despite the name, has absolutely nothing to do with planets. It's a bit of a misnomer from astronomical history, you know, when they were first observed back in sort of like the 1800s, they were mostly round and they had kind of rings, so people thought they looked like a planet in a way, and so they got dubbed planetary nebula. Apparently we have William Herschel to blame for that. And what they are instead is the outer layers of a star that's been thrown off at the end of its lifetime. So a star that's not really big enough to go supernova, something like the sun and maybe lower masses as well, where they expand to what we call a red giant phase. And then once they've gone through that phase, they shed those outer layers that have expanded into this giant ring and you get left with this sort of remnant core of the star in the center, which is actually still emitting UV radiation. And it's that UV radiation that then hits that surrounding material that's been thrown off and it ionizes that material. And what I mean there is that it causes electrons in the atoms of that gas to jump up to another energy level. And then they don't like being there and that's not where they're supposed to be. So they jump back down to where they're supposed to be and then they give out light. And that's always the exact same wavelength of light. So the different colors come from the different elements. So you get a lot of red light from hydrogen, the first transition from sort of the second level down to the first. You can also get very blue light from hydrogen, which is the third level down to the second as well. It's something we call H beta rather than H alpha. And then also you can get greenish blue light from oxygen transitions as well. And it's actually a really short phase in a star's lifetime. So a star like the sun that will make one of these planetary nebula will probably live for about 10 million years or so, the sun having lived for about four and a half to five billion years of that already. But this planetary nebula phase will only last something like 10,000 years. 10,000 years will give you such a crick in the neck. But what it does mean is that all the elements made inside of the star are actually thrown out into the surrounding space. So usually what's happening inside of a star is nuclear fusion. This is the process that causes them to give off so much energy and light, which is great for us here down on Earth. And what happens is you take four atoms of hydrogen and you turn them into an atom of helium. But that can only happen in the very center of the star where it's hot enough and dense enough for those reactions to be forced to happen. But eventually you'll reach a point where you fill the region of the star where it's hot enough and dense enough for that kind of nuclear fusion reaction to occur with all of the helium. And at that point, the star starts to make all the heavier elements through further processes of fusion. So into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the way up to iron in the biggest stars. So this process of throwing out all this material in a planetary nebula means that the next generation of stars that form will have carbon, oxygen, nitrogen there in order to make planets, and in the Earth's case, provide the elements needed for life. This is why everyone is always like, oh, we're made of stardust, because, well, we are. <laughs> anyway, this hourglass nebula was actually originally discovered by Annie Jump Cannon and Margaret Mayall when they were working at the Harvard College Observatory at the sort of end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. They were working as what were called computers at the time. So computers to you and me are machines that do all of the jobs and calculations that we don't really want to do. Well, back then, women were <laughs> the machines that did all of the work and calculations that nobody else wanted to do. So professional astronomers would hire women to go through their data as computers. Just like that film Hidden Figures about the black women that worked in NASA during the space race that basically did all of the mathematics for us to get people into space, back to Earth and to the moon as well. 
they were considered computers too. And if you haven't seen that film, like, what are you doing with your life? Like, just stop watching this video and just go watch that film instead because it's amazing. We have been through this. It is not possible. There is no protocol for women attending. There's no protocol for men circling the earth either, sir. But when it was first discovered, Annie Jump Cannon and Margaret Mayo just kind of classified it as a, like a fuzzy, roundish looking nebula. They didn't have good enough telescopes to actually reveal that hourglass structure. And so it wasn't actually until very recently that that was actually discovered. It wasn't until the 90s that we actually had an image that revealed this beautiful hourglass shape and also how red the surrounding material was. And now you remember I said that red light comes from hydrogen, so that makes sense. There's a lot of hydrogen in stars. But what is making this weird hourglass shape rather than just something that's perfectly come off the star in a ring like we see with normal planetary nebula. So this problem is still ongoing. We don't actually know how to describe what are dubbed these extreme bipolar nebula. So there was a study that came out last year in 2018 by Clyde and collaborators that tried to come up with an explanation for the hourglass nebula. First of all, you can see that the remnant star that's supposed to be in the very center of the nebula responsible for this expulsion of material outwards is not in the center, it's actually offset slightly. Also, there's two hourglass structures there. There's the main one that you can really see, but then when you actually go and look at higher resolution in the very center, there's a secondary one, which is actually then offset the first one by a very small angle, by about five degrees, the tilt. And so any formation theory that you come up with for this hourglass nebula has to both consider, first of all, how you get the hourglass shape, second, how you get this secondary hourglass in the center, and third, why the star also isn't in the center itself. So one of the theories that comes up all the time to try and explain the shape of these bipolar nebula is the fact that it's not just a single star, it's two stars, i.e. a binary star system that's created it. A system where you've got two stars orbiting around a common center of mass, which might sound weird, but actually nearly 50% of all stars in our sky are actually binary stars. You can actually see one tonight if you're in the Northern Hemisphere anyway, this is the one I know. One of the stars in the Big Dipper or the Plow, so like the handle of the Plow, is a binary star. And if you get binoculars, you'll realize there's actually two stars there, not just one star. And essentially people are drawn to the idea of binary stars to describe anything that is not symmetrical. So in this case, the Hourglass Nebula is very asymmetric. So perhaps it's been caused by two stars orbiting around each other. So what you wanna do is search for a companion star on your image. And again, a binary star might explain why the star in the middle isn't in the exact center and that it's offset. But unfortunately, this paper by Clyde et al in, in 2018 didn't find any companion stars in that center. There is one just outside the center, but it's so far away from the other star, it's unlikely that they're actually in a binary system together. And also from the shape of the nebula and the position of the star, it's unclear as to how that star in that position would have actually produced that shape. So it's more likely that that star is actually what we call a field star. So a star that's not actually near the thing we're actually observing, but actually is maybe in the foreground or in the background and is just part of the general distribution of stars that we see in the sky. It could just be though that this companion star is in the middle somewhere and it's just incredibly faint so we can't see it. If it is faint, what you'd wanna do is use the infrared to search for it because even if it was very faint in the optical, it would still glow because it's a hot star and you'd be able to see it. The thing is that there's a lot of infrared light in that central region, which is bouncing around off all of the gas and dust in there that was thrown off the star in that expulsion that created the planetary nebula. And so you've just kind of got this like low level diffuse infrared light in that whole region, which could underneath it could be hiding a very faint companion star. We just don't know. But since they haven't managed to find a companion star, instead, the collaborators on this paper were like, well, what else could it be instead? What else is this shape reminiscent of? It's actually quite reminiscent of the weird bubbles that we see out of the Milky Way caused by the accretion disk around its central supermassive black hole. So the author said, well, what if this star also has one of these accretion disks? What if there was some material around the star that settled down into a disk that's now sort of swirling and spiraling onto its surface? In that case, you could create the shape, but then why would your star then be offset? 
But the thing is though, we have some idea of the energetics involved in this expulsion of this material because of how far the material's gone and how fast it's moving when we measure it. But they worked out that if the star was just accreting generally material from around it in its general vicinity, there was never gonna be enough stuff there in order to give you how much energy you needed to create this hourglass shape. So something else must have happened that also must have shifted the star from the very center of the nebula as well. So their idea was that actually there was a planet around this star that in that red giant phase and expulsion of material had been sort of vaporized and then that material is now what's formed an accretion disk and is spiraling around it. It would have to be something that we call a hot Jupiter. So a planet that is Jupiter sized, but instead of orbiting really far away from its star, like our Jupiter in the solar system does, it actually orbits very, very close to its star. And so it's a very, very hot planet. So if it was orbiting that close, then yeah, it would have been affected by this red giant phase and then this expulsion of material. So that clearly would have affected the planet's orbit and it would have started falling in towards its star. And the energy in that process actually could have kicked the star out of the original center of the planetary nebula, caused this accretion disk where material was spiraling in and then giving off energy as it was expelled back outwards again in the nebula and caused this weird hourglass shape. Now we find a lot of these hot Jupiters when we search for exoplanets. And that might be because we're biased to finding them because they are so big, so they're easier to spot and they have very short orbits. And so they repeat very often so we can be sure that that's what we've seen. But still we know that there is a very large number of them around stars in the Milky Way. And it's been long thought that you should find them orbiting around white dwarfs, this remnant that you get after the end of this red giant phase of these kind of stars. So, but they've never really been found. And so the hypothesis was that, well, probably they were destroyed in the red giant phase when the star swells up. But this paper from Clyde and collaborators last year suggests that they could be a very strong contender for the object responsible for these weird, creepy, beautiful, extreme bipolar nebula, like the engraved hourglass nebula. Why yes, I do absolutely love this t-shirt. Thank you for asking. You gotta read it like, you're toast. Where is the engraved hourglass nebula in the sky? Cause I did not write that down. I did not write down how far away it was. And it's actually a very short lived stage of a star's life. It's only gonna be around for something like 10,000 years or so. 10,000 years will give you such a crack in the neck. Sorry, this isn't an ASMR video. I'll stop doing that. Get on with it. Why men great till they gotta be great? Turns out we're my face.